Okay, so. Hello everyone and welcome to today's talk. We'll get started momentarily after we give another minute or so to have people um, have a chance to log on at the last minute. We thank you very much for joining us. So Brian, I'm gonna keep an eye on the attendees, look at the number and then let's wait for maybe two, three more minutes to okay. start. Wonder. Wait for the laggards. Yeah, that's true. I see the names of our, many of our common friends from all over the world, literally. Is a participant called Clean Air. Welcome, Clean Air. All right, I can tell we have more than uh, 60 participants, attendees already. Brian, do you think, I, I think probably we should just start, let the rest come in by themselves slowly. All right, um, here we are. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, everybody we can see, friends or new friends, colleagues we've never met and uh, from all over the world. Welcome to this event um, for the Environment in Asia Research Series. Um, my name is Lin Zhang, Zhang Lin in the Chinese way. I am an environmental and economic historian for um, Tangsung, China. I teach at Boston College and uh, for the Felbank Center for Chinese Studies. I am um, acting as a convener for the research series Environment in Asia. So welcome all of you to join us. So today we will have our first event for this uh, new semester. So um, one thing I wanted to quickly mention, currently I am in Hangzhou, China. So I, uh, I'm really concerned about the Wi-Fi since I'm calling all the way from the other side of the world. So in case, um, things uh, the Wi-Fi quality goes down and if I drop offline and you will not see me again in the middle of the wonderful talk. So Brian and uh, our colleague at the Felbank Center, they will carry on the, uh, the event. So um, you can carry on without me, but I hope uh, such a thing will not happen. I don't want to miss the talk. So um, without further ado, let me introduce today's uh, event and our wonderful speaker, Brian Lender. So uh, first of all, uh, Brian actually is right now not in the United States either. So he is in Paris, France. So we, uh, two of us together with uh, our colleague Mark Grady who organized this event in Boston. So we are literally literally hosting a global event for all of you. So what a wonderful occasion. Um, so all of us want to wish you, especially those of you who celebrate Spring New Year. So uh, we wish you Happy New Year and we are so happy to see you at the opening of the Year of the Tiger. So Brian here, 
is going to talk to us about his recently published book from uh, Yale, Yale University Press. So the book is called King's Harvest, a, a political ecology of China from the first farmers to the first emperor. Very interesting book, which I had the privilege to read. Um, actually, an early draft and then the final printed version. Really wonderful work, and I learned a great deal. So um, Brian is a environmental historian and also a scholar of archaeology for early China. So he currently teaches at Boston, no, sorry, <laughs> Brown University for the history of a department, and he's also associated with the Brown Institute, Research Institute for Environment. So um, Brian um, is currently on research leave, but uh, it's a, such a wonderful uh, opportunity for him to call in from Paris to speak about his new book. So today's event, we will have a roughly about 85 minutes from now on. So Brian will speak about 35, 40 minutes, right? Um, and uh, depends on how time goes. I wish I could use my convener's privilege to ask a couple of questions if I don't lose my Wi-Fi access. And then we will open up for the Q&A section. For the attendees, all, all of you die in and call in to, uh, to participate in this event. You cannot see the questions uh, posted to the Zoom's Q&A section. So um, we will work as your discussant, as, as your um, 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 convener to read out your questions. So I encourage you to uh, spend a, bit, a little bit time to type out your thoughts, your comments, your questions by using the Q&A function of the Zoom platform. So um, I will read the question out loud to all of the participants, then Brian will respond, let's hope, to all of them. So here is our plan. So without further ado, let me turn to Brian. Welcome, Brian. All right, uh, thanks a lot for the uh, great introduction. It's nice to be here um, in this, um, what, what's the word? I don't know, in this global event that isn't happening in any particular place. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about uh, my research. I'm gonna actually go straight to my um, screen. Let's see, whoops. All right, are we good? Can you see that? Great, um, okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about the ecology of China's early political systems and particularly the case of Qin. So my book essentially begins with the beginning of agriculture and goes all the way until the fall of the Qin empire. So my talk today will really focus on sort of the last section of the book um, and Qin in particular. Let's see. Okay, so the focus of my research is essentially the central yellow river, va river valley, which is the Guangzhou basin of uh, Shanxi, and then the, the Yellow River Valley to the east towards Henan. Um, and in particular, this includes the Xi'an area, which was the home to uh, Xianyang and Chang'an, the two um, imperial capitals of that region, and then Luoyang, the other imperial capitals. So this is really the main center of imperial power for a lot of uh, ancient Chinese history. And the question is like, how did the formation of in political systems uh, impact the environment. And in fact, I should say, we're going to talk about this more later, that I initially started out wanting to know how those environments changed over time. And the political aspect of the story came through the sources. It wasn't the, it wasn't the question I set out to, to explore. Okay. So I'm not going to talk very much about the sort of wider ecology part of the story, but if I can use this uh, slide as a way to introduce the big, the big picture, um, I did a lot of research on the wild plants and animals of um, the Guangzhou Basin. I published uh, the, this article in early China a year or two ago, if anyone wants the details, and also another article with Kate Brunson 
Um, and essentially, if you had gone back to the Xi'an area five or 6,000 years ago, you could have run into all, any and all of these animals. Um, rhinoceros, wild horses, wild water buffalo, seven kinds of deer, tigers, leopards, two kinds of bears, and, and so on. And this is just the larger animals. So it was also a huge amount of other biodiversity. Now, if you go to Xi'an now, how many of these animals can you find? Or even in the sort of rural areas of the Guangzhou. Whoops, going in the wrong direction again. I just got a new keyboard. So these are what's left. Essentially, the only thing, the only wild animals, the only wild mammals you can find in the densely populated Guangzhou Valley are some bats, which tend to live in human houses, and hares, which uh, eat human crops. And so that's the big picture. Like there used to be a, a whole enormous amount of biodiversity and now there is not, why not? And so the question is to think about the different elements of human history over a very long time period that led to the gradual disappearance of, of almost all of the wild plants and animals of this region. So the, the concept I'm gonna to use today is political ecology. And this is not the, uh, the field of that name in geography and development studies. Basically, I just combined the dictionary definitions of politics and the diction, uh, dictionary definition of ecology and came up with the study of how the form, organization, and administration of states affect the distribution and abundance of organisms. Um, and so in the big picture, um, especially agrarian states, tend to increase the availability of agricultural organisms, a very small number of them, and decrease the distribution and abundance of most other types of species. And we can expand this to think about even modern states. Um, essentially, the argument is that states promote the expansion of ecosystems and economies, which in some ways are the same thing, that produce taxable resources. And this is true of all states throughout human history. They States um, essentially get their resources from a limited uh, number of a limited sphere of ecology, and they want that to get bigger, and they want everything that they can't tax to, um, well, they don't necessarily want it to disappear, but they certainly don't mind if it does. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to early China, and in particular, the region that I'm studying. So if we look at the history of political organization in the central Yellow River Valley, Go back to the Neolithic period, let's say six, 7,000 years ago, you have egalitarian settlements with little political organization. There was essentially no kings. There's no people who are in charge of everybody else and tell them what to do um, in a very large scale. If you move on to the Western Zhou a few thousand years later, you have a hierarchical alliance of polities with a weak central government. So you do have, you have kings, you have armies, you have the ability of uh, political groups to mobilize resources and mobilize people, but you do not have an emperor, a person who is in charge of millions and millions of people. When we get to the Eastern Zhou, both of these came at the same time, you have frequent warfare between states that leads to state strengthening innovations. And my book has a chapter about that, essentially how states build up their capacity to extract more and more resources from, from their the areas they control, and more and more resources, more and more labor from their populations until you come to the Qin Empire, which is the last of the Eastern Zhou states to survive, in which you have a centralized bureaucratic state with direct control over people and land. And so my book essentially goes through this process of how you went from having a society with no kings and no, no rulers and ruled to this highly powerful um, centralized imperial system. Now, one of the key figures that I talk about is Xiangyang, um, who was the minister, the chancellor of the state of Qin. Um, and he essentially is a key figure, both because he was one of the architects of the Qin imperial system, and also because he is a person whose history is very well told uh, by Sima Qian and others. And so he is, in, in some ways, the story that we have of him is actually a composite of, of longer term projects processes, sorry, because he came from, um, from states further east that had developed these things over time, and then he sort of brought them all together in Qin. And so his system was characterized by agricultural fundamentalism, essentially the belief that only agriculture is actually productive and everything else is more or less parasitic. 
uh, a system of ranks or um, orders of uh, merit in which you actually reward men based on how well they do in the military, essentially trying to Re recreate society so that serving in the military and paying your taxes is actually a way to get ahead in society. So people want to do it. Um, and then a system of rent, land re redistribution to reward people for their, um, for their ranks. So the more higher rank you get, the more land you get. And Xiangyang is of course also famous for emphasizing written laws. And essentially, along with some other theorists of political systems, um, a lot of emphasis on writing and systematization. And this is useful for historians because the Qin state ends up producing a whole lot of documents. Okay, so Qin reached the height of its power during the reign of King Zheng, who, is, who declared himself the first emperor uh, in 221. And then after he died in 210, the empire essentially fell apart. And so uh, what I'm gonna do today is, is analyze just give an overview of the ecology of how the Qin Empire worked as an ecological system during that exact period. And we happen to have quite a lot of ex, uh, documents that were excavated from this period. So we now have the ability to, um, to understand how the system worked. Whereas even a generation ago or two, we really just had a very vague idea of how, what Qin was like as a system. So in terms of sources, we have, um, archaeological evidence. The most famous piece of archaeological evidence related to Qin is obviously the terracotta army, but we also of course have things like animal bones and even uh, beautiful um, bronze animals from the same tomb. We also have the uh, received texts that have been passed down since the time of, well, since the Han 2000 years ago. So this is an image of uh, Sima Qian's uh, Shiji, the historical records, which is a key text. And then, and then we also have excavated documents. And so um, excavated documents, in particular, we have uh, large numbers of documents that are actually written by local officials. And unlike um, these official texts, they're essentially unedited. They're the, the everyday bureaucratic paperwork that give us a really good idea of what was actually going on on the ground, usually in sort of very distant places. Uh, the good preservation conditions in the Qin Empire were in particular in Hubei and Hunan of uh, South China that uh, is not, was not at all an important part of the empire. So we have an interesting um, slice of, of bureaucratic uh, information. Together, all of these things tell us um, quite a bit. So this is the approximate area of state control at the height of the Qin Empire. And if you look at... Um, Oh, yeah. Red dots ind indicate commanderies, which are the highest administrative units. They're essentially military um, administrative units under Qin. Under Han, they became more part of the standard uh, administrative system, more like provinces. Um, and if you look at this map, this is a map that comes, well, I think I modified it a little bit, but it mostly was made by somebody on Wikipedia. And I think that this map is actually much better than the maps that are printed in most uh, English language and Chinese language history books, because most standard history books present all of South China as being part of the Qin Empire. But Qin, of course, had just conquered these regions and essentially they had a network of routes that it could move its armies along. And it controlled key areas such as um, the Guangzhou area, um, in particular Hunan, but actually apart from what's now Hunan, um, Jiangxi and Zhejiang, um, and maybe the Shanghai area, Qin actually didn't have very much power south of the Yangtze River. But it did control some of the key agricultural areas. And that gets to my next point. If you look at these, the distribution of commanderies and you compare it with the distribution of agricultural land in, in East Asia or in mainland East Asia, you can see that the key, the best farmland in East Asia is the North China Plain and the East China Plain all the way down to Zhejiang. Um, and then you also have the Sichuan Basin, and then you have the area of Hubei Hunan, which was much less uh, developed at the time. Now, if we look at them, if we compare this map with the map of the Qin Empire, we find that they mapped pretty well. Essentially, the Qin Empire was really focused on the most productive agricultural areas in the continent and did not, they didn't bother extending their administrative control into mountainous regions because those regions did not produce enough resources to actually repay the cost of controlling them. They certainly would have attacked them if there had been any rivals in them, but there weren't by this point because they'd conquered them all. 
Okay, so I'm going to go over six aspects of Chin political ecology. Have we got a question? Oh, we got a Pokemon question. I'll leave that for later. <laughs> Can you still see my slides? Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to close the. Okay. So we're going to start with information and then talk about farmland, then granaries, then human labor, then animals, and then non-agricultural resources. Uh, sorry, just fixing my screen. So information was pretty key to the whole system because they didn't have particularly good roads at the time and there wasn't a, a well-developed um, um, system of canals like there would be later. And so the ability to move the key resources of the political economy, which was a particular grain, was quite limited. And so the state essentially functioned by controlling how surplus resources and labor were used at the local level all the way across the empire. Unlike modern uh, political systems, they couldn't concentrate wealth at the capital and then redistribute it. They actually had to leave it where it was and be the ones who decided how it was used. And so there was a huge amount of uh, writing on wood and bamboo being sent across the empire. So here is a, um, one of the laws from uh, excavated at Shui Hudi. And it says, when rains are timely and the grain ripens, immediately report in writing the crops, grain and ear, and the area of cultivated and uncultivated fields. Immediately report the area of land affected by drought, violent wind or rain, floods or hordes of pests that injure the grain. And so the, what's interesting about this is that in many periods of later Chinese history, uh, empires essentially just set a fixed tax rate on a piece of land and you paid the same thing every year. Whereas Qin had a much more intense, uh, because Qin's political system was developed in the Guangzhou Basin, which is quite small, they had a very intensive form of governance. And they tried to keep this form of governance going, even as they spread all the way across the subcontinent. And this arguably is one reason why the Qin Empire collapsed, is because this was too, in, too um, energy intensive of a way to run a large empire. But in any case, the point is that the local officials had to tell the central government how crops were doing all across the empire so that officials in the center of, in the capital, could make decisions about how much uh, grain was going to be available um, all over the place. Um, every year, this is from the early Han laws from Zhang Jiashan, but I think that this is probably a Qin law like most of the early Han laws. So every year, um, local officials sent the following registers up to the county court. They had to send records of people's houses, yards, and household members, their ages, their land and neighboring fields, unified field registers, and field taxes, which means that the state was keeping very close tabs over the two things that were most important to its power, namely land, productive farmland, and human labor. Um, the, another interesting thing we have from the Ye, which is a well from, from uh, Western Hunan, we actually have a list of all the things that local officials made lists of. And so that's what these registers are. They're essentially just lists of what, what is in the local, um, local county government. So they kept lists of grain crops, of loans, of livestock, of equipment, of cash, of laborers, of uh, cattle, horses, sheep goats, um, and of course, of the office, office of fields. And so they're the county government, or this is kind of a garrison, but they're essentially keeping track of all the things that they have, could keep track of, probably so that officials, if they needed to, could sort of audit what was going on. This was to make it difficult for local officials to steal and so on. But this tells us that the, the state, well, first of all, it gives us a list of the things that the state considered important, was keeping track of. And it also tells us, um, gives us some idea of how carefully um, they were monitoring what was going on in all across, um, in their, their offices across the empire. Okay, this is, let's talk about farmland. So as I talked about earlier, Qin had a system, which, you know, seems imaginary, but apparently actually worked, where every single adult male would be, um, would have a rank. So there was a standard rank that you had if you didn't win any ranks. But if you did if you did well in war and cut off a lot of people's heads, you would be awarded a higher um, area of rank uh, 
or a higher level of rank. And with that came a whole bunch of benefits, um, including, for example, re reduced sentencing if you got in trouble. If you killed somebody or something, you would um, maybe not uh, get your eyes poked out or your fingers cut off or something. Um, but you would also get more land. And the way they did this is that they divided the landscape into strips. And each strip um, was um, one mu in, well, it was essentially every strip was one mu and uh, a mu was a standard, it's kind of like an acre, it's a standard uh, measure of land. And because they were strips, it was very easy to redistribute them according to if you got more, or if you got less. So this image that I'm showing is actually a Google Earth uh, image of the landscape just west of Xianyang, the, the Qin capital. And um, if you look at the measure here, this line, this, can you guys see my uh, arrow? Yep. Okay. So this line is essentially the, the exact measure of, um, of a Qin uh, um, bu. Well, it's a mu would have been that long. So what this means is that this landscape was laid out in these lines, either in the Qin or in the early Han period. And of course, if you look around the landscape of North China, you can find all kinds of different widths of measure. So it isn't like the whole landscape is still just as it was by Qin and Han. But if you, if you search around on Google Earth, you can actually find a fair number of places where the measures are actually of, around this width. And that means that those areas are almost certainly remainders of the official uh, field layout system of the Qin and Han which was again created to um, reorganize society to incentivize people to want to fight in the army and of course to pay their taxes because the government knew exactly how much land they had. The next uh, big part of the Qin political economy was granaries. This is a, a granary model a model of a granary that was discovered in a Qin tomb. And this was quite common in uh, Qin and early Han was to put models of granaries in your tomb, presumably because a granary is something you wanted in the afterlife. Um, but the point uh, for the Qin political economy is, as I said earlier, Qin could not move grain all over the place. Essentially, farmers' taxes were all stored in granaries in their local districts or their local county office. And then during the winter, when people had to do their labor service, they went back to the granary and the government issued them a certain amount of grain that they could then eat. And most of the grain at this time was millet. And so they, people were eating millet, um, which they sort of boiled up in gruel or in uh, kind of like dry rice um, and ate it like that. But the, so, the, so the state essentially took their surplus grain in the form of taxes at harvest time and they gave it back to them in the winter time when they did labor, which was required as part of their you know, sort of like labor tax corvée. And they ate, in, you can think of it as them eating the grain that they themselves grew in a sense um, while they labored for the, for the state. And so there's a lot of uh, statutes on granaries. This one is one I like because it's funny. So it says it is the practice of the court that for three or more rat holes, the responsible official is fined. Three mouse holes are equivalent to one rat hole. So they had a very precise measurement of the holes of the um, rodents that were getting into these granaries and punishing people, uh, officials for, you know, for allowing those rodents to get in. And this gets to the bigger issue, which I discussed in earlier parts of my book of the human, the sort of the larger ecology of agricultural societies, which involves all kinds of uh, animals that humans didn't really want there, including the few, plus the few that they actually did. And so mice and rats are a big part of human societies at this time, as are dogs and so on. There's also regulations on feeding convict laborers. So this is for this is from the statutes on granaries at Shui Hudi. So a male bond servant, a bond servant is a type of for, uh, hard labor service. So a male bond servant receives two bushels of grain per month. A bond woman, one and a half bushel. No rations are given to those not engaged in work. Non-adult wall builders, which is another status of prisoner, and bond servants who are working get one and a half bushel of grain per month. So, so essentially, the, there were a lot of convicts, a lot, essentially, all kinds of different punishments, uh, all kinds of different crimes were punished with a sentence of labor. Some of the sentences were rather light, and you could sort of serve them on and off. And some of them were very heavy, in a sense, the state was going to work, probably work you to death, unless you were really tough and could survive. 
The other thing that happened more and more in Qin is that the mutilating punishments, like cutting off hands and feet, were, um, what's the word? I can't remember the word. They were, um, anyway, they, they switched the, the, they decided that it wasn't actually very practical to cut off people's hands and feet because then they were not so useful for the rest of their life. And so instead they would get them to pay heavy fines. Um, and, and the fines were paid off, at, were paid, you were paid to work for the government, but the amount you were paid was so low that it meant that you would be working for the government for a very long time. So between those two different types of servile labor, the government had a lot of labor at its disposal in addition to the corvée laborers. And so this gets to the issue of human labor. And if you, this is an image from the Qing of a, a canal being dug. So it's just an idea of, makes you think that by the time of the 18th century when this was made, China already had 2000 years of experience organizing large numbers of people to modify the environment. And this one is interesting because you actually, um, the description talks about how they're divided into teams and the teams worked for, for prizes of um, liquor and dried meat and stuff like that. And so the, there's a, a whole like managerial expertise that's been built up um, that's, that would have already been in place uh, under Qin and Han. Um, and so the Qin empire had huge amounts of labor at its disposal. It had millions of subjects and those people had to do um, they had to do work for the government and then they had convicts who could uh, you could send the convicts to places where you where normal taxpayers wouldn't want to go and so on and this if you read Sima Qin's description and Jia Yi's descriptions of uh, Qin and what was wrong with Qin a lot of the focus at the time was essentially that it was abusing people's labor it had so much labor that it was just getting people to do all kinds of useless projects and you know if, if you send all the if you send the the healthiest members of the family to go work for the government. You're leaving the weaker members uh, to do all the actual productive work. The actual foundational labor that society is based on is being done by people other than them. And if you are that, usually men, you would be very bitter about knowing that your family are, are toiling back home while you're doing something totally useless, like building the emperor's tomb. Um, so this explains why the state uh, tried so hard to keep track of individuals. And if you think about the fact this is 2,200 years ago, it's rather astonishing that this big empire had records of every single, or tried to keep records of all of its, uh, all of its subjects. And so this is just a, a standard one from Chu. So Jing means Chu, the, the state in the South, which had its own rank system that was still being employed. So the, the man's name is Manqiang. His wife is called Qian. He has a son of this rank, different rank, lower rank than his father, a daughter, and then a slave. And household slaves were not uncommon at this time. But as far as we know, uh, slavery was not employed as it was on the other end of Eurasia in the Mediterranean at this time for large scale agricultural production. So slavery was not con convict labor was exploited on a massive scale, but officially slave labor was not. So if we think about what the state used all of this labor for, a lot of it were routine statute labor tasks. So for example, the statute on agriculture that was excavated in Sichuan, in fact, was later copied into Han Law and reads, in the ninth month, do a great clearing of roads and dangerous sloping passages. In the 10th month, build bridges, repair dikes and dams, and ensure the smooth flow of water at fords and bridges. And so basically local government officials are, um, going around their landscape and trying to make it more efficient, more productive. Uh, the water um, infrastructure is really important for irrigation, for producing crops, for pre preventing floods. And of course, things like bridges and roads are essentially opening up the landscape for the movement of goods and the movement of soldiers and creating a more uh, efficient humanized landscape. And so if you think about this on the scale, this being done every year, this is right after harvest time for many people. Um, this is really the empire from the center imposing its vision of uh, sort of good infrastructure across the subcontinent. And this is a map from the early 20th century of the famous Dujiangyan work um, in Sichuan. And so what that did was uh, built an irrigation system up at the top here on the top left and then redistribute water all the way across the Chengdu Plain. 
And this is a classic colonial project because Qin conquered this region from the state of Shu and essentially destroyed the indigenous um, political system, brought in a bunch of colonists, reorganized the landscape, and, um, and essentially created this huge, really productive agricultural area that they then used to build an army to conquer the state of Chu downstream in the middle Yangtze region. Now, the archaeologists, um, some of them from Harvard, have done a survey of this region and found that this, some of the system may actually have been in place before Qin conquered. And in fact, we don't we know very little about the state of Chu. But in any case, Qin conquered this region, um, colonized it, and continued to reorganize the landscape to make it more productive. And this, the, there was another project, the Zhengguo Canal, which I discuss in the book, um, in, in the Qin capital region of Shanxi. But on more of the irrigation systems would have been smaller scale, the type of thing that local government officials dealt with, and things that we actually know very little about because they were so small scale and local that they're not mentioned in our sources. Um, another famous, um, famous uh, mega project was the Long Wall. And so Sima Chen says, in my travels, I saw the Long Wall and fortifications that Meng Tian built for Qin, cutting through mountains and filling up valleys to open up the straight road. The first emperor indeed treated the people's labor lightly. And so he, this is, the, this is essentially the stereotype of Qin, is that Qin was just so abusive, it used people's labor so intensely. And uh, scholars such as Dirk Bada in the West have pushed back against this, but my opinion is that it's probably more or less correct. And it's also just hard to explain how an empire as successful as Qin in taking over um, the um, taking over such a large enemy area and defeating all of its enemies, which just destroyed so quickly by uprisings. And clearly the explanation that people were fed up of being treated like livestock is actually a fairly convincing one. This is an image of what is officially the Qin Great Wall in Guyuan in Ningxia, but I've been told that this might actually be a Ming Wall, so, so I don't really know. Of course, uh, the most famous uh, of all of the mega projects is the first emperor's tomb. This it's so big that it looks like a hill and the, the terracotta army, which you all know of, is just, the, just one part of the complex. Gideon Shalak has uh, estimated that this may be the largest uh, tomb ever built for any single human being in human history. And this probably is based on the fact that the great pyramids are built for more than one person. But nonetheless, they, this is an absolutely massive project, all built within essentially the lifetime of the great emperor, while all of these other things, the Great Wall and everything else, were being built. And so um, really people were, and so much chance as hundreds of thousands of families were moved to this area to build this tomb. So really huge amounts of human labor being used to build these projects. So um, in addition to human labor, we also have animal labor. It's interesting if you think about all of the many types of life that are living in an average Chinese village at this time, um, you have, well, I won't go through it. You can read uh, chapter two of the book, but there's very few that the state seemed to manage to tax. Uh, in particular, there, every village had pigs and chickens and dogs, and you don't see anything about those animals in the documents. They essentially, the government didn't find a way to get people to pay taxes on them. So they were tax free. The animals that were taxed in particular were horses. Uh, well, not tax, but the, the state was very concerned about horses and cattle, and uh, probably also the herds of sheep and goats in northern China. But because we don't have any texts, we have we don't have any local texts from like northern Shanxi, northern Shanxi, Hebei, and so on. So we don't actually know what was going on. But uh, Sima Qian discusses the herds of those regions as being one of the great uh, the great wealth of the Han Empire. But horses were the animal that the empire was the most concerned about. And in fact, horses, of course, are something that many Eurasian empires were totally obsessed with because horses were the tanks of the ancient world. They, they were, I mean, if anyone has ever been at a demonstration or something and seen police on horseback, you immediately feel how much somebody on a horse is more powerful than you are on your on the ground. And if you can get huge numbers of horses, then you really got a lot of power going on. The other thing that happens around the time of the Han Empire is that you have the formation of the nomadic empires. Um, well, they essentially are formed 
right as Qin collapses. But you have very powerful nomadic pastoralists um, in what's now Mongolia and Inner Mongolia. And of course, they were very good on horses. So there, there's more and more incentive for states to have horses. In fact, the state of Qin from the very beginning was a, a horse breeding uh, state. So that was one of the reasons why Qin was powerful and was able to defeat its rivals. Um, and so that's why there's so many great horses in the terracotta army. Um, another one were cattle or oxen. So there's a, a passage in the Zhang so that says Qin uses oxen for plowing and can transport food by river and provision its crack troops with the harvest from first grain lands. Now, this is interesting because there's been a huge debate in, especially in China, about when uh, ox drawn plows were invented in China. And my theory about this is essentially that the question is not really when were they invented. The question is, did people have enough oxen to actually pull plows with? And I think that many of the core regions of China were so populous that people just didn't have enough land by this period. In particular, pick, particular the, the central plains in Hunan, that area was already quite populated. Uh, at this time. And so there essentially wasn't a whole bunch of land around for grazing. And so there just weren't that many cattle. And so Chin's rivals looked at Chin and said, wow, look how many cattle they have. They actually can use uh, oxen for plowing. And there's records from the Chin laws of Chin and lending uh, oxen to farmers. There's also the other type of animal, which is dangerous animals. And there's a, an interesting legal case from the year where it says that six people can be exempted, which means from taxation and labor service for catching a tiger. So the government is actually telling people, go kill tigers. They're dangerous. They're eating our livestock. They kill people. So get rid of them. And of course, if you look at the map of wild tigers now, it is, they're totally absent from China. And happy year of the tiger, by the way. <laughs> But they, they, so tigers are gone from China and there's been a long uh, push to make that happen because tigers are, according to the field guide to the mammals of China, the only mammal that uh, regularly eats humans. Okay, let's go to state control over non-agricultural resources. So the state functioned primarily, like the key thing was the photosynthetic energy gathered from the sun by millet plants um, and then gathered in granaries and distributed um, to people working for the state, to its soldiers and corvée laborers and so on. That was essentially the core of the sort of energetics of the Qin Empire. But they also needed other things. They needed wood and they needed metal in particular. And so this is a picture of the Western Guangzhou, just Northwest of Baoji. And you can see that uh, the, the Guangzhou region itself is a very arid and doesn't never had dense natural forests. Um, whereas as soon as you move into the mountains of the west or to the south of the Guangzhou basin and the Qinling mountains in particular, you have very um, big uh, trees and dense, beautiful forests. And so the Qin had, Qin had another advantage over many of its rivals, what, which was this enormous access to large areas of trees. Um, Qin was also the innovator of legal protection of resources, as far as we know. In the second month of spring, do not dare to cut timber in mountain forests or to dam or dike water courses. In summer months, do not dare to burn weeds for ashes or to collect indigo, young animals, eggs, or fledglings. One should not poison fish or turtles or arrange pitfalls and nets. These prohibitions end in the seventh month. So this is, um, you, could, you could argue this is one of the world's earliest environmental protection laws. Um, you could also argue this is um, the government taking control over resources that had previously not been under state control, which was a big part of state strengthening in the warring states period, as I talk about in the book. So you have, uh, you can look at these, um, these types of laws in, in both of those ways. You can look at them as a, a state power, but also as using state power to, um, to increase resource sustainability. Of course, whether this was actually effective is a, a different question. I highly doubt the state was able to um, monitor wildlife like hunting, fishing, and logging for more, more than sort of core areas of the empire. Okay, so that's one element of it. In terms of forestry, um, one of the most amazing pieces of evidence we have are these maps that were 
uh, excavated from Fang Matan in Gansu, and they, well, they look like this. So they're pieces of wood that essentially the, the squiggly lines are rivers. So most of the area of the map is just rivers with names written on them, but there's a bunch of piece, uh, things written about pine and other types of wood. There are, there are some wor wor wood names that we don't, we can't identify. And in fact, some of these, you know, essentially there's been uh, the group at Wuhan University has done infrared photography on these. So, so we now know more about what they say than we did before, but we also know that we don't know what a lot of the words mean. In any case, it's a map from the far west of the Qin Empire, the upper uh, Wei River Valley. Um, it's near Mai Jishan, where the famous uh, Buddhist caves, for anyone who knows where that is. So this was excavated at a modern logging camp in the 1980s, which shows that people have been logging this region for over 2,000 years. And it shows that Qin officials were keeping, were making maps of this area and keeping track of where the, the timber was. Um, oh, before I go on to my conclusion, the other thing that Qin uh, paid a lot of attention to were metals. Um, and at the time of Qin, Qin was essentially around the time that iron was starting to become very common. So iron was certainly around, but bronze was still in widespread production and it was one of the main metals in use. So this was sort of a transition period in metal. And so the Qin empire kept careful track of copper, tin, lead, and iron production and actually had very large productions of, of this. They also produced a whole bunch of other types of handicrafts like ceramics, which also have their own uh, environmental effects. The main uh, environmental effects of producing metals is in fact, all of the wood that you burn to produce them. And so they, a lot of these uh, metal production sites were based out in forested areas where they could cut down forests as much as they wanted to. And so the, it, um, and this gets to the issue also that, that firewood was being, was the main use of wood. So people in their houses were burning a whole bunch of wood as well. So wood was producing a lot of energy um, in addition to the sort of energy people ingested in the form of food. So if I can just summarize my argument, the state facilitated the expansion of fam farmland. So the Qin empire had conquered a whole bunch of, it conquered much of the subcontinent, in particular, it conquered all of the really good agricultural land. And in all of those places, it encouraged the spread of agriculture, the building of more irrigation systems, water control systems, roads, so that people can get in there and can bring resources out. Um, it used the surplus grain and labor of its subjects to build infrastructure that facilitated the movement of people and resources and reorganized hydrology. And so you have expansion of farmland and then infrastructure being built to make it easier for people to exploit the environment in ways that can be taxed. Um, the state also mapped out and exploited natural resources and also tried to protect them from over-exploitation. So you do have both aspects of, uh, of state control over environments. And perhaps most importantly, Qin established the model for 2,200 years of subsequent states and empires to follow with enormous environmental consequences. So this model of having a fairly centralized government and a sort of hierarchical administrative system divided into larger units and smaller units and each um, you know, with um, chains of command, essentially, all the way from top to bottom, which, you know, to, to modern people seems like a pretty obvious thing. But if you looked at the world 2000 years ago, even, you know, later than Qin, you look, for example, at the Roman Empire for much of its um, existence, it really didn't have that. The Roman Empire was very decentralized. There was no massive bureaucracy at all until the third century CE. Um, so essentially this was highly unusual for its period and it set a model that people have followed ever since. Um, in particular, I think, this is my theory, I haven't found anyone who's written about it, but I think that the existence of books like the Shiji and Han Shu, these ancient Chinese texts that really have a huge amount of information on how administration actually worked in the early empires was one of the reasons why people were able to keep recreating a similar model is because they knew what it looked like. Um, and the reason I emphasize this is because the, traditionally people have said, oh, China has been the same for 2000 years. And what I'm essentially saying is that the Qin and Han model was written down and people kept going back to it and saying, yeah, that's actually what we want. 
that's you know rulers would hire the literate literati to help them recreate this system over and over and it's a very effective system for transforming the environment getting rid of natural ecosystems that are not productive and replacing them with things that are taxable this is one of the reasons why china and east asia more generally has some of the most severe human impact on earth and just to bring it more modern oh so this is my book um, it came out two months ago what i just talked about was the um, was essentially the, the last chapter or second last chapter um, and the previous if you have any questions about the earlier part i'd be happy to answer them in the uh the q a maybe i'll i'll just leave it there wonderful thank you thank so you. much Brian, uh, for introducing only the last part of your book and actually i am going to use my privilege as the organizer to encourage you to talk a little bit about the previous part the earlier parts of the book for one particular issue um in, in your talk you um you, you, you introduce a lot of um, um, written textual sources, you know, traditional sources that uh, early China historians that tend to use. And of course you rely on archeological artifacts information, right? But I do notice that in your research, there is a strong component that is you use a paleoecology, ecolo paleoecological data and a natural scientific data. Um, um, and this part, um, that part of information did not come out from your talk. So can you speak a little bit about what kind of those non unconventional, non-traditional materials that you used in your research? And can you say a little bit about, um, in general, the research methodology that as a you know, historian like you, you have to put together in a combination right, to, to produce, in order to produce this kind of a book, right? Um, Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so as I talk about at the beginning of the book, I, I was studying at Hong Kong University in 1999, and I was taking this like my first ever Chinese philosophy class. And I found this passage in Mengzi, in Mencius, that talks about how people have cut down the trees and, and how there's overgrazing on, on Ox Mountain. And I was like kind of blown away. I was mainly blown away because I didn't realize humans had damaged environments until the industrial era. But also I was like, whoa, we could actually study uh, environmental history in the ancient past of China. But then I started reading more into early Chinese thought and found that there are very few other passages like that. <laughs> Essentially, there's like, if you try to find people just talking about how we have transformed the environment in this way or that, you don't really find it. It's actually quite rare. Um, and so, I, so then I started looking for other sources. And so that, then I realized that there are, for example, I think I started studying pollen. So pollen is, um, of course, the, comes out of uh, flowers and just happens to be a part of plants that is quite sturdy, even though they're like um, really tiny and they get well-preserved. And so you can use them to figure out vegetation in the past. And so I've discovered those kind of first and I started studying palynology at McGill. Um, and then I realized that there's climate uh, data and there's uh, macro fossils. I studied macro fossils with Gary Crawford at Toronto, which are seeds. So you have charred seeds and stuff preserved in sites. Um, and essentially then there's animal bones um, and so on. And so I sort of, the more I looked into this question, the more I realized that the best evidence is not the sort of received tra uh, tradition from the, from the classic texts. It's actually other stuff, including archeological evidence. It's also things like wood. Then I learned about excavated documents and started reading about early Chinese law. And I realized these legal texts actually talk a lot about environment stuff. And that's actually what led me it's almost out of desperation um, to this question of political ecology, which was really not, as I said, what I wanted to study at the beginning. I wanted to do is just standard environmental history. How did this ecosystem change over a certain period of time? But you realize from just because politics is so central in so many early Chinese texts that politics was actually pretty important in society and arguably was more important in, you know, in Zhou, Qin, Han era than it was in many other ancient societies. So it led me towards this question. And in the end, I actually took out a lot of the more, there was a big section of 
of the earlier work that was on ecology. And I have published a lot of that stuff separately. So I've published the article on wild mammals of ancient China with written with Kate Brunson, um, which is just about mammals. Essentially it's like the, the explanation of the image I showed at the beginning. And then I had a whole chapter about the ecology of the Guangzhou be- region, which I published um, in early China. And then, so the, this book just keeps the political narrative, but the key to the political narrative is agriculture. And so then I really got into the archeology span of agriculture, of animal domestication, plant domestication, the ecology of human societies and all that stuff. So, so yeah, I essentially realized at a certain point that there are specialists working on all this stuff, but there's actually not very many people synthesizing it for audiences who don't know about this kind of data. And so I decided that that would be my job. Mm-hmm. And you did a fantastic job. And I would like to encourage all the attendees and our audience for today's talk, in particular, in particular to check out the um, epilogue of the book, because in that, I think Brian really laid out your um your, what would you mention here, this emphasis on political system, not only for the, in order to study the, the, the past, the, uh, our history, right? China's history, but also to look into our future. So political system seems to Brian is the answer to tackle the ongoing climate change. So I think that is very interesting piece of um, uh, literature in your book. So um, I don't want to keep you here uh, just to, uh, to in, in a conversation with me for too long because we do have a lot of questions, important questions. So we have a precious 33 minutes left, Brian, and yet we have many, many um, wonderful questions here. So I would like us to go through them as, as go through as many of them as possible. Um, so in order to do that, we need to ask you to be to for, to keep your answer to be more economical. So let's just begin uh, going through the order. So um, quickly, first question. Um, because the audience cannot see the question, so I'm going to read out the question very quickly. So. Um, first question comes from uh, comes from uh, Ogden Ross. That Qing map at the beginning when you used looks like the current extent of the modern Han. Is there simply a um, extension from your historical period to the modern, with variations along the way? Uh, well, I think the Han. If you look at the I mean, if you look at the distribution of, for example, native speakers of Chinese, it now includes all of the provinces south of the Yangtze River, whereas in Qin it didn't. So I think one thing that's kind of really historically important about Qin is that Qin conquered all the way from the Yellow River Valley down to the South China Sea, down to the border with what's now Vietnam, and all the way to Fujian. And then it's basically taken the Chinese empires the subsequent 2000 years to gradually absorb and digest that region. And if you go to Yunnan now, you can see this sort of process of assimilation happening very quickly. Um, So I think that actually that whole region was totally not Chinese then and it is now. Thanks, Brian. Let's quickly go to the second question um, by Larissa Pitts. How does the chain measure up in terms of its negative effects on biodiversity as compared to other large empires in early history, such as the Roman Empire? Oh, thank you. That's an interesting question. I actually asked uh, Donald Hughes, who is an environmental historian of the Roman Empire, essentially what was the environmental effect of the empire itself. And he basically said there wasn't much of one. (laughs) And I think that's not true, but uh, it was an interesting reply. But I think that essentially, like if you, the key to the Roman empire was essentially the peace, the Pax Romana. They, They conquered the entire Mediterranean and kept it at peace for centuries so that people could, you know, they could colonize new land and they could, you know, humans, humans multiplied and economic growth occurred. And that means that people were actually replacing natural ecosystems. They were increasing their intensity of land production, but the state wasn't directing it. 
um, and in Qin and in the Han, I think the, the state was paying a much more active role, much more planning going on, much more like people in the central government saying like, let's cut a road through here. Well, I mean, the Romans did a lot of roads, so that's a bad example. But the, the, the Qin and in particular the Han, because the Qin didn't actually have a huge environmental effect because it only lasted for like 15 years. I mean, it, it lasted for 800 years in Shanxi. So in that way, it's the longest lasting Chinese dynasty ever. But in other ways, it's, um, it's, it was so short that it didn't make any difference. But the Han recreated the Qin system and lasted for 400 years. And the Han's impact was very much uh, moving, co colonizing southward, colonizing the southeast. I think that the, the region where Ling is right now in Zhejiang, that region was totally alien to the Chinese speakers in the North, people who spoke whatever language they spoke in Henan and Shanxi at the beginning of the Qin Empire. And by the end of the Han Empire, it was more or less Chinese. Um, there were essentially the people who spoke non-Sinitic languages were up in the hills and everybody in the lowlands spoke some form of, uh, of a Chinese language or a Sinitic language. It's popular to say Sinitic, but Sinitic is just the Latin word for Chinese. So I don't uh, put too much emphasis in that. But uh, yeah, so I, one thing I emphasize at the epilogue or in the end of the book is that Qin did not have a particularly large environmental effect until after it was gone. And it's sort of shadow has continued. Even the current Chinese uh, government's conception of what a good government looks like is heavily indebted to Qin. Mm -hmm. Can I quickly add something to what you just said, Brian, here? So you brought up this compare, basically the contrast between the state, if state cost effects and also the societal-based environmental effects, which are for the early China, at least, and for Roman Empire, I assume the same, it, but are less understood, right? So the conventionally we tend to believe because it's a state organized, so we tend to create, uh, generate negative effects. And we tend to believe indigenous societal practices cause less or more positive environmental effects. So there are tons of debate these days by, uh, about this kind of a bias um, which has been carried out by uh, scholars in the past several uh, several decades, by especially by environmental historians, right now. So I think there are more and more efforts to go and in, going into looking at the societal. Actually, uh, look at China, for instance, the three thousand years of unsustainable development, which was coined by uh, Mark Elvin and repeatedly used by us, right, to talk about actually Chinese society. People, ordinary citizens or the rural peasants actually committed to um, damaging biodiversity just as how the states has been doing. So, um, so I, th I think we need to actually bring societal forces back into the conversation in order to make the assessment of the states more meaningful. Of course, it's hard to do for early China. If I could just add to that, I mean, one of the issues here is that Chinese archaeologists who work on the Zhou, Qin, Han, and later periods really don't care about um, common people. They don't care about um, economic productivity. They don't excavate villages. So we know very little about sort of local society, the average person's life in this period. That's one of the reasons my book focuses on politics. I definitely don't think the state is all powerful or is even the most important part of the story at all. I just, uh, it's the one thing that you can tell a story about in ancient China. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's move to the next question. So let's bring up the question from Ian Miller. So um, Ian says, a general question for Q&A at close would be interested to hear you discuss the differentiations across various forms of armed free labor, slave serve, COVID, extra, uh, et cetera, and the ways they intersected with the gender, ethnicity, regional identities, as well as the different types of environmentally engaged work. How do you think about these systems, which must change a great deal over your vast time scales in comparative terms? Apologies, Ian says, I may be called to a meeting before you end. Lovely talk, Brian. Okay. All right. 
that's an interesting question. I think for the question of, of sort of ethnicity, we really don't know what's going on with a lot of the Qin Empire. We just don't have sources on um, non sort of Qin or non Han people. Um, to, well, I mean, we have sources on like the northern uh, northerners, but if you think about the people who lived all across the south, archaeologists are not really exploring their sort of mountain villages, and they are not mentioned in ancient texts. So a lot of the ethnic interactions in early China are really unexplored. Um, I'm actually quite interested in the history of Jiangnan, of the southern of the lower Yangtze, and there's really so little that we know about this period, even though that that whole there was so much going on there but we know almost nothing about it. So I would say that there are whole huge lacunae in our knowledge. In terms of gender, as I talk about a little bit in the book, I think the fact that males came to control society and, and you, know, you, you go from societies in which there was some equality of gender more or less to societies in which men run the show and have big armies and are telling everyone else what to do. For me, that is actually the most important gender issue. And the issue of like how the average commoner family divided labor is not going to tell us very much about the environment. It's the bigger, bigger societal political issues that make a difference. Um, I don't really have very anything intelligent to say about the different categories of, of labor. Um, but it's something to think about. To wait for your next book. And Not actually, my book. <laughs> there are many more questions coming up. And uh, I wonder if uh, you and our audience, especially for those audience who are very keen to hear answers from you about their questions, do you mind to stay behind for five more minutes in oh, order for... Mind. Wonderful. I have time too. So, okay, let's go to Steve Harrow. So, Brian, what comes to mind from listening to you is historical continuity. Not only can you use a present day aerial photos to illustrate Qing agricultural landscapes and a Qing woodblock prints to illustrate Qing COVID labor, but the kind of labor regimes you talked about were still active in the Dujiang Yan area up to the 20th century. Um, everyone had to participate in the Sui Xiu to clear out the, uh, the canals downstream. Also, the Great Leap Forward illustrated what happened when you relocate too much farm labor from uh, uh, for infrastructure projects. What does this say about either ecological determinism or historical cultural essentialism? Thank you. Very interesting question. Well, one thing I would say is that if you look at what the system you described of people being required to do routine maintenance on water systems, you see something very similar in the Netherlands, and you'll see something very similar in regions in other parts of the world in which the maintenance of local water systems was essential for everybody to stay alive, either to protect from floods or to create irrigation. And so to some degree, there's a sort of functionalist explanation there that that local society is going to need to do that regardless of what happens at the state level. Whereas the thing that the um, Great Leap Forward has in common with Qin is precisely the sort of larger, much higher political, the ability, once you have very powerful political systems, the people at the top can make big mistakes and can tell people to do things that they definitely know at the time are not a good idea and they still have to do them. Um, so I think, you know, those two examples show two different types of logic at work and all of these things are going on. The other interesting thing, if you think of, I'm, I'm sort of saying these types of dynamics were at play over and over throughout Chinese history. But if you look at Chinese history at any given year, you'll you maybe won't see them happening or you'll see things moving in the other direction um, so um, so I definitely don't want to give some kind of because I'm discussing like big structures doesn't mean I think that they are dominating everything that's going on mm -hmm. can I we actually add one sentence here I want to bring back what you said at the end of your book I think this echoes um, or contradicts to some extent the 
question here about continuity. At one point toward the end of your talk, you mentioned um, you actually try not to emphasize that there's a long term to seven years long continuity. What you try to emphasize is how later generations, um, uh, rulers, right, states, government, governments constantly, repeatedly re resort to the earlier um, Qing Han practices, right? Uh, they resurrected them and uh, to use them for uh, new purposes. And I, I, I think this is a, perhaps more a, a more dynamic way to understand con continuity. Um, so I just want to bring this one point of your talk back into the conversation. But let's move to the next question. Uh, um, the next question comes from Stuart Young. Um, there seems to be a dearth of interest in mulberry um, cultivation and sericulture during the Qing uh, as compared with the earlier and the later periods. Is this the case? If so, any idea why? I think, you know, if you look at the, if you look at all the different aspects of the rural economy and what farmers were doing in a Qin village, um, silk was just one of the things. And in fact, I think silk is sometimes overemphasized in some of the early sources because silk production was the stereotypical female activity. So if you read the Shijing, the Book of Odes, there's, I think mulberries are actually the most, most commonly mentioned plant in the entire collection because, not because everybody was making silk, but because when you wanted to talk about women's labor, that's what you talked about. Um, but I think that if we look at many, I mean, I would actually argue that farming millet and even cooking millet, like what people, everybody was growing millet, everybody was eating millet. And if you try to find any scholarship on how people cooked millet and ate it, there's almost nothing. And so even more basic aspects of people's everyday life are neglected than mulberries. But I would say that the mulberry is, um, there is some good scholarship um, such as Dieter Kuhn's book um, on like, how people processed um, mulberries in early China. But what happens with early China is that you just don't have enough data from any specific period. So you have to do what I do in my book, which is talk about thousands of years and try to draw out the different strings of evidence um, to make a whole cloth of the picture. And I think if we looked, if we tried to do, um, you know, mulberries in the third century BC, we would find just a few passages or whatever. So I think that's the, the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's move on to um, Chen Yuan's question. And then Chen Yuan um, offered, uh, actually um, wrote down two comments, or two questions. So we're just going to pick the first one here. Sorry, Yuan, uh, for skipping one, um, the other question of yours. So Chen Yuan says, hi, Brian, congratulations again for the book. And um, it is a major contribution to the rising field of environmental history of pre-modern China. Great. I have some questions about horses in the Qing. Were the Qing horses on par with the nomadic horses? Did the Qing engage in any horse trade uh, with either the nomads or other states? What was the utility of horses to an average agricultural household at the time? Okay, thank you. So the, the very, the earliest record of Qin that we have in the Shiji that I consider to be a real record as opposed to the like mythical ancestors that Sima Qin feels uh, the need to give to every single group of humans um, is a record of how the Western Zhou King in fiefed um, the ruler of Qin with a, a fief out in what's now the Wei River Valley or that area of Western, of Southern Gansu. Um, so essentially from the very beginning, Qin were breeding horses and Qin were way out. You know, if we consider these sort of highland areas, if you look at the place called Qin An in Gansu, which is the region where the name Qin, Qin comes from, there's a lot of sort of high Los Plateau meadows and that's like perfect horse breeding territory. So Qin essentially came from and always controlled an area that is essentially on the Southern edge of the steppe, um, almost the steppe. Um, and so Qin essentially is, is part of that ecology throughout its history, even as it moves in and becomes a, a, a fully agricultural settlement. As for what type of horses they are, they're probably this more or less the same horses as in Mongolia, which are much smaller horses than we're used to now. 
but we don't really have, you know, we don't have fine grain information on horses from different regions. And certainly there was trading going on back and forth between North and South and like between Chin and the, the people of the pastoralists and between Chin and people to the East and West and South. So horses were certainly part of that. You know, we're talking about hundreds of years. So certainly the Chin's willingness to trade these great war machines to different polities depends on geopolitics. Mm -hmm. Also, right. very much looking forward to um, Chen Yuan's book. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, fantastic. Let's move on to Karen Turner's question. Karen Turner says, asks, do you agree with Charles Asaft that Qing relied on communication and a corporation um, other than, rather than, other than, I guess, other than brutal force to harvest the sources and maintain order? Um, basically, no. I think Charles Sun just ignores all elements, all evidence of violence in the Qin Empire and completely fails to address any of the numerous historical accounts we have of Qin's collapse. He just doesn't talk about the collapse because if he had to talk about the collapse, he would have to deal with the fact that a lot of people really didn't like the Qin and that doesn't work with his uh, evidence. So I actually think his analysis of how information moved in the Qin empire is brilliant, but his uh, idea that this is the big thing about the Qin empire is um, not true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Actually, I don't really know about that part of argument. So thank you for offering the question and the answer. Fantastic. So um, we will skip Chen Yuan's second question here. Sorry, Yuan, but we let's move on to another question. So questions, the two questions, a couple of questions from Amanda Power. Uh, Power. So let's say the first one, one is whether the influence of uh, these texts and this model can be traced through other Eurasia states of this nature and how it's it related to uh, Assyria. And, uh, okay, maybe I could quickly read out the second. The other is about populations. So Brian's up to you, which one to pick to, 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 to you, you choose to answer. The other is about population thinking about Jim Scott's model in against the grain of a patriarchy childbearing as a element in this picture. Is it possible to say how this works here? I guess okay. this will reflect in parts of your talk. Right. Okay, thank you. Oh, before we I answer those, I did want to mention that Charles Sanft has an excellent article on our early Chinese environmental protection laws published in environmental history. Um, I was going to mention that during the talk. As for like movement in Eurasia, I don't think we have, I mean, um, what's his name? Um, Creel in his book on Western Zhou bureaucracy talks about how like in medieval, uh, is it Sardinia or Sicily, um, the kings knew about China's examination system and were trying to implement it. So by that period, by let's say the time of the Mongol empire, you definitely have movement across. Before that, I would say there's very little knowledge of China um, outside of East Asia. But um, I think one of the best accounts I've read about this is, I think it's the introduction to the Cambridge history of China on the what's it called, the Mongols and alien regimes or something. Um, but the introduction basically talks about how in earlier periods, you have the Chinese empire, you have the nomads, and then you don't really have sophisticated, well, even the nomads, you don't have sort of bureaucratic written government systems anywhere else around the Chinese writing empires. And by the time you get to that period, all around the sort of central plains, including Japan, Korea, Vietnam, um, you know, Burma, all the way up into the nomad areas, you have uh, political systems that are very strongly influenced by the Tang system. And so both the Han and the Tang, I mean, the Han colonized Korea and Vietnam, and those two places eventually broke away and essentially continued some element of Chinese political system. Korea, uh, Japan copied it and inner Asian states copied it as well. So I think you can trace many elements of the Qin Han system uh, to areas across Eastern Eurasia, but not beyond that until much later. Mm -hmm. Oh, and about patriarchy. I, my argument in my book essentially is that, um, is that 
and it's sort of a, a guess, but that if you want to understand why human societies states are dominated by males. And, and in fact, the, the word king in the title is a reference to the sort of gendered nature of political uh, system we're talking about. Um, one of the main questions, or the, the, the answer is very strongly related to um, how large groups of armed men became considered essential to human societies. How did, how did armies form and how did the guy in charge of the army become the person who's in charge of, of societies? And I think that that's actually essentially large groups of violent guys with big sharp pieces of metal and horses are, is a key to understanding why men become dominant in society. And I also think that everyone told me to take it out of the book, but I actually believe that male or bi men are biologically um, more violent than women. And so having societies that are actually run by men has an implication. I basically think the eco-feminists are right. Um, and so I think that, the, and if you want to understand patriarchy, you have to actually go back to the, the beginnings of, of states and the beginnings of militarized societies. And that is actually why patriarchy exists. But, uh, and I really looked into the, our, the scholarship on this. And what I came up with is that we don't have enough evidence from early China to ever, or early anywhere to actually prove that argument. But I think uh, that there's good reason to, you can, you really can trace the origin of male dominance to the origins of highly militarized societies. Mm -hmm. Thanks Brian, for your question. At several points, and you actually repeated it going back to this gender issue that Ian brought brought up at the beginning. So it seems like this, this is something quite can be quite productive if you pursue deeper. And I want to quickly mention Amanda. Uh, Amanda is a uh, um, historian, medieval historian, uh, historian medieval Europe working on environmental humanity. So so I, I just wanted to point it out. Your book is now reaching out beyond the field of Chinese studies. So congratulations. So um, the next question um, um, is from, um, for, forgive me if I pronounce your name uh, terribly, uh, Grand Noblitz, if I pronounce it wrongly, sorry about that. So Grand Noblitz, thanks so much, Brian. Um, so I am doing my PhD at Harvard. I'm curious how you see the state's evolution and shaping of the ecological landscape having impacted social, particularly kingship institutions. That's a very, um, that's a question I talk about a lot in the book. Essentially, if you look at, well, to go to the broad picture, you sort of have a, uh, a situation throughout human history, which is when you have a, the way you form a very strong government is to reduce other elites. So we, when you have a weaker government, you have powerful people at lower levels of society. So if standard feudal model is essentially, you have a king and the king is first among equals. He doesn't actually have any power, but everyone says he's our king, but actually if he has to depend on all of the people below him. And then once you get a system like Qin, there's nobody who can challenge the emperor because the emperor is in charge of everything. And so throughout Chinese history, you have essentially, if you look at the fluctuation of central power, that's the inverse of the fluctuation of the power of the aristocracy or the oligarchy or the elite or whatever you want to call them. So in the early, before you ever have the formation of a powerful empire, you have essentially power groups scattered all over the place and nobody who controls them all. Qin and early Han, you have a, a very strong center and that breaks down again. So for most of the medieval period, you have the oligarchy or aristocracy having quite a bit of power and no very strong central government. And then, so for all of Chinese history, that goes up and down. And so to some degree, kinship is related to that because kinship, the more, um, well, I mean, kinship is always part of political power in every system and any idea that even modern systems don't have kinship are pretty easy to disprove by looking at all the dynasties in every democratic country, for example. But, um, but the point is that you do have this interesting um, up and down that goes between whether the state is powerful or whether it's essentially primarily kinship groups other than the ruling family. I don't know if that actually answered the question, but... Video point. 
Thank you, Brian. Let's move on next next uh, to next question by uh, Ding Xiangli. Um, so, hi, Brian. How unique was the political ecology of the Qing in comparison with? Uh, 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 to other warring states, do you see more similarities or differences? That's a good question. And the answer is we don't know. And we mainly don't know because Qin destroyed the records of all the other countries. <laughs> so we, we have some records from Chu um, excavated documents. And in fact, there has been too little research done on them, probably because they're really hard to read. Um, but for the Eastern states like Wei and Qi and so on, we we just don't know what they were like. And everything we know about, almost everything we know about them comes through this lineage of like Qin taking their ideas and then Han central government officials sort of looking back at them, which is a sort of lineage, which means that we don't really have independent knowledge of how the other ones worked. But I think what most people would say is that the Eastern states like Qi were more commercial. And so the, the fact that it was this highly agrarian highly labor-based, highly central, like the Qin system was based so much on controlling the labor of individuals and controlling what they did because there was not a commercial system that they could extract resources from. So you could imagine if Qi had defeated the other ones that the whole Chinese mo political model would have had a lot more space for commerce and for sort of private capital and that type of thing. Whereas, um, it, it, one of the reasons it didn't is because Qin set up the model. And then the Han, when, after the Qin collapsed, the Han set up its government in the capital region of Qin, thereby sort of perpetuating that model of governance, even though the rulers of the Han Empire were actually from Chu. So they, in theory, could have done something different. But in many ways, they kept the same model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. And um, um, we're going to... I, I hope Mark, uh, who runs the show, really the real person to organize this event <laughs> is okay if we extended the, the, the event a few more minutes because we have so many questions. But let's try to be economical and try to finish as many as possible. So here comes our friend, Mindy Schneider. So Mindy says, hi, Brian and Ling, and it's so nice to see you both. And thank you for a great talk. Can you talk more about how pigs, chicken, and the dogs weren't taxed? You said that the state couldn't find a way to tax them. Why is that? So was it social, ecological, cultural, dietary, all of the above? Um, thanks. That's a good question. And the, the, there are actually some laws that say that talk about, for example, a local government office might own its own chickens or its own pigs, I think, but definitely chickens. And so there are rules about where the money goes if you sell some of those chickens. But my theory is essentially that, you know, you had these little villages, every, there were chickens running around, there were pigs running around. Maybe they were starting to put their pigs in pens at this time, but um, th most families just had a few chickens and maybe one or two pigs. So there's not really way a local government can, they, they can't just like, um, they can't just say, give me one leg of your pig, right? So I actually think, and this gets to James Scott arguments, his argument in against the grain, which is essentially that grain is a key thing for political formation because of the way you can just take a certain quantity of it, store it, and it's still good and so on. So, so essentially the state really focuses on commodities, very few number of commodities that, it, that are easy to move around, easy to store, easy to collect a certain percentage of and so on. And so the idea is that chickens and pigs just didn't work that way. Thank you, Brian. Um, this is really wonderful. And I'm going to skip the next question comment because we uh, uh, mentioned um, the, we got a question from the same um, person. So we're just going to go to another uh, person, uh, Benjamin Gallant. So thank you for the fascinating talk. One thing that appears often in transmitted texts is the production of hemp or silk cloth by women, okay, but we have women again, but that doesn't seem to be as important in Shui Hu Di Corps as the granary. How should we think about the political ecology of a cloth production? So this is related to the previous question that you answered, I think, to some extent. 
Thank you. Yeah, I wonder about that too. I think the answer is a sim simply that some parts of the empire probably specialized in producing uh, hemp. And so in some places, actually the Yuelu uh, texts, which people um, don't like to study because they were stolen, they actually talk about people paying their hemp taxes. So people did pay taxes in hemp. And I would wager that there were certain parts of the empire that were really good at producing silk that paid all of their taxes in silk. Um, and so I think that uh, sort of the grain model was a standard model, but there was probably um, certain regions that uh, did things a, a different way. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. Next, the next question comes from uh, archeologist Michael Storzen. Um, and, I, and I just realized actually um, this scholar is from Newcastle University and I'm just, oh, wow, why? Oh, actually, I spent a year teaching at Newcastle University back in 2008 and I feel a little bit nostalgic seeing this, this post. So hi, Brian, this is a Mike Storzen, Newcastle University, really wonderful talk, thank you. I'm particularly interested in the use of archeological evidence to construct the narrative around a change in use of irrig irrigation, like uh, Zhengguo Canal and Dujiangyan to conquer neighboring kingdoms. Do we have good estimates for the amount of the land and crop that these projects would have produced on an annual basis? Do you see this as being a major uh, catalyst for cheese growth? Uh, thank you. Um, so to start at the end, um, definitely this was a catalyst for Qin's growth. Sima Qian basically says that the building of the Zhongguo Canal is what made Qin strong and allowed it to conquer its enemies and become an empire. So he just says straight up, this is a really big deal. And it was because it was right beside the capital of Qin in the middle of the Guangzhou Basin. So to have a reliable agricultural production area there, regardless of uh, droughts, was a big deal. But our sources on these projects are really terrible. I mean, it, what we know about the Zhongguo Canal is essentially a, a romantic story from early China that is probably fictional. Um, and the numbers in it don't make any sense. I have a, a section in the book on this, the end of chapter four, I think, that's all about like, what does this number mean? And my answer is that the number probably doesn't mean much of anything. Um, and for the Dujiangyan Canal, there aren't even records of that existing in Qin. Like there aren't records from the time of Qin. And I think you, yeah, essentially we, the records and Sima Qin, it's like three or four characters total about it. He just basically says, Qin sent this guy and he did this water system. So we know nothing whatsoever. And even in centuries later, even if you go 500 years later and look at everything that is available on Dujiang Yan, it's just a few sentences. And so actually we know nothing about it. And the archeological record is pretty terrible too. And I mean, what people have actually looked at. So the answer is that we don't know very much. And um, we also, also like mo there would have been small scale water control works all over the empire that we literally, I just, I'm sure that they existed. But apart from that passage I showed about dikes, we don't even have evidence of local people using irrigation at all. So, um, so yeah, we, we were waiting for you, for you geoarchaeologists to show us what was going on. Brian, listening to your answer make me feel, you know, as a medieval historian, I feel like I should not complain about the shortage of sources at all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. So um, let's go to uh, Tom Chase. Tom Chase asks, um, advances in uh, uh, metallurgy in Eastern Zhou and Han have been connected to social mobility and increasing wealth in the middle class. Can you say more about the location of the metal resources and the development of iron in Eastern Zhou, Qing, and Han? Big questions. My general theory, basically, when I started studying this type of thing, I was reading a lot of Chinese scholarship on metallurgy and they put so much emphasis on the social effect of metallurgy. And I think this is essentially Soviet style kind of, uh, like in the Soviet Union, they essentially had technological determinism as their main, they didn't want class to be part of their main Marxist analysis. So they put all the emphasis on technology. And so Chinese historians followed that and just said essentially like metal changed everything. And I just think that's not true. I think that 
I actually think that the beginning, like the beginning of metal in, in the Bronze Age made a huge difference. The, the fact that some people had sharp weapons and horses and other people didn't made a big difference. But when you get to the switch between bronze and iron, um, it's harder to say that it had some kind of absolutely enormous um, um, effect on society. But certainly if it did have an effect on society, it would have happened in the early Han dynasty and not before, because that's when iron becomes really widespread because the state starts producing iron tools for everybody. So it's possible that agriculture, agriculture improved at that time. Um, so that's sort of my, my theory. I think that the, the, if we want to talk about that story, it should really be focused on that period. As for where they got the metals, we know some, we know there's a lot of copper in Hubei, for example, but uh, there's still a lot of questions about where some of this metal was coming from. And there's a group at Cambridge working on these questions, doing uh, analysis of metals, and they're telling us more and more about this. So, so we're going to learn more about it in the future. Fantastic. Okay, wonderful. And uh, I'm going to skip Steve, uh, Steve, your uh, question. Actually, this is more like a challenge to Brian. So Brian, maybe you can practice it privately and back, go back to sleep to try to give us a social, political, economic history early China in two minutes. Ha, ha, ha. So you're going to do it with Steve next time you meet, I assume. Let's quickly bring up the next few, uh, just two, two questions. Wonderful work. Um, uh, from uh, the next question is from Tim Newfield. Wonderful talk, thank you. I uh, I was uh, going to ask a similar question as a Professor Ling Zhang. I'm a bit of a outsider here. Uh, synthesis of uh, um, um, phylogenetical data. Um, Pal palynological. It's my mind. <laughs> uh, data are currently reshaping what we uh, think about Roman and a late and and antique land use, and the land use change over time in the Mediterranean region. Um, are palynological uh, data changing what has been said previously on the basis only of a written archaeological sources in the Qing Empire? Uh, if uh, if evidence from the natural sciences does not fit neatly with the other sources, how do you handle data from different fields that are or seem to be contradictory? This is a great right. question. Yeah, good question. So, well, it seems to me that in China, palynology was really popular like 20 or 30 years ago, maybe 20 years ago, when they didn't have any big fancy machines, they just had microscopes. So they would go out and you know, get soil samples and look through them for pollen samples and do these pollen analysis. And now people are not into pollen in the same way. They use it as just one more climate proxy. Um, or, you know, they're just like, I'm now interested in the wetlands of central China, which I, it should be ideal places for preservation of uh, pollen. And there doesn't seem to be anyone working on it at all. Um, so essentially, I feel like people move towards speleothems, uh, which are like stalagmites, which are really like kind of sexy in the field of um, climate studies now. And palynology is seen as some kind of boring old technology that people don't use very much. Um, but even more so, um, there still hasn't been a real synthesis in China of all of the different types of environmental science and archaeology. They tend to work separately. Um, and the science people tend to be asking, they tend to be sort of doing a pollen analysis of thousands and thousands of years and then doing a, like a pollen chart. They're not like going to specific sites, analyzing the pollen with the archeologists and then trying to figure out like, what was this site like, like they do in the Mediterranean. And so essentially I think that Chinese archeology span has a lot of work to go in that direction. But as I said earlier, people who work on the historic period of in China don't do archeology span on common people at all. They mostly just study tombs and big cities. And so basically look, it's almost as if they're just searching for treasures to put in museums. And I actually asked the head of the Shanxi Archeology span Bureau about this once. And he just said, it's not us, it's the bureaucracy. Like if we tell them we're gonna dig up a village, they're just gonna put that on the bottom of the pile. They're not gonna, they don't care. Like trying to explain socioeconomic history using archeological tools is not something that the bureaucrats who decide what gets excavated in China are care about at all. And so essentially that whole sort of form of archeological analysis is not happening for this period. 
But the thing that makes it very frustrating is that they do this type of stuff in the Neolithic. So Neolithic archaeology in China is really, really good. And they actually bring in all the tools and they do great stuff. They excavate small villages. But for the historic period, they don't do that kind of stuff at all. Um, so it's rather frustrating. And that's actually my the whole structure of my book is designed around the fact that I have all this evidence for the Neolithic and then I just don't for later periods. I want that's to appreciate that. Question, Brian, um, based on very limited archaeological tools that, that I participated. So um, it's a similar kind of experience. A lot of the artifacts actually were dug up and a part of in the backyards of the Wenwu Guanli Su at the local level and nobody bothered publishing anything about them. So as scholars, as historians, you couldn't really access those data. So right. um, situation here. Great. And um, so I want to very quickly brought up, uh, bring up the last question. So, um, oh, yeah, Brian, you typed something. Mm -hmm. Let me bring this up. From the last question from Terry Kleeman. Um, Terry says, actually, there are Han era statues of Li Bing that give more information on Du Jiang Yan found archaeologically. This, oh, OK. Not a question. Please just show to Brian. So but I read out publicly. So yeah. um, no, that's very good to know. It would be helpful for our archeologist, Michael um, um, Stock. Gosh, my mind is so slow. Storosen. I, I would expect that those uh, statues still would be more like that. That guy was really awesome and not like it irrigated exactly this amount, you know. Okay, great. But nevertheless, thank you, Terry, for supplying that information. So we, Brian, you answered all the questions. And so thank you, everybody, for participating in this event and for contributing your thoughts and questions and suggestions, shared information. And uh, thank you, uh, Mark Grady, um, at a Fairbank Center in Boston. Thank you for staying for a much longer time with us, allowing us to finish all the Q&A. And of course, thank you, Brian. This is um, such a wonderful opportunity for you, you know, for us to learn about your new book and the entire apparatus of your scholarship. Um, I'm so glad the book comes out in such a beautiful way. And I hope many, many people around the world read it. So thank you for being thanks, here. Thanks a lot to you and the Fairbank Center and Mark. This has been great. Wonderful. So everybody, if you're interested in the book, reach out or you have more questions, reach out to Brian. And uh, um, uh, I just want to quickly mention for um, the, if you are interested in following us and we have um, several other interesting events coming up. So please um, look at, check out the Fairbank Center's website to look for our future events. Thank you, everybody. Happy, um, happy, the new, happy New Year for the Year of the Tiger. So I will see um, see you more often in the future. So Brian, Thank take you. care. You Paris. too. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Bye.